What a tremendous uh, transition and segue into uh, the, the preaching of the Word. Can you open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6? And happy birthday, praise God. We celebrate an anniversary today of 16 years of Hope Reformed Baptist Church's existence. The Lord has been faithful. The Lord has been very good this day. Oh, well, yesterday, 16 years ago, Craig Ireland and Katerina Ireland as young uh, uh no, no children yet. They now have five. They rented a small little, uh, uh, it's basically a pantry uh, storeroom, but we'll call it an activity room in the Springwood uh, Community Hall. They opened up and on their first day of church service, they had a crowd of two. Uh, them. That was it. And I think there was a visitor. So the church of three, two or three gathered. It's very biblical. There they were. Uh, There's three in the Godhead. That sounds holy. The three people is the best to start with. And uh, Craig opened up by preaching the word of God. Uh, It would have been funny to see half of the congregation preach, half of the congregation lead in worship. And uh, then they closed out. And in God's goodness, they were able to move to a main hall as the numbers and giving grew. Eventually, they were able to uh, rent a large Seventh-day Adventist uh, church that uh, was, uh, was where church was meeting at the point that I, I actually joined Hope Reformed Baptist Church at that point. In 2016, the Lord opened up this opportunity. A lot of money was given. A lot of labor was volunteered to fit this place out. It was a warehouse before this. And since then, the Lord has been good and faithful through high and low to hold fast the testimony of the gospel to save souls. And here we are today. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. And what a joy it is to be at a church among people who are so hungry to see God glorified and the nations won and the gospel go out that they will give of money, they will give of time, they'll give up on weeks of work, they will use their leave not to go to the islands on holiday, but to go to the islands to preach the gospel. The gospel is going forth and it will go forth until Jesus comes back and those who align their short, tiny, missed breath blip of a moment life, those who invest their tiny, tiny little life, you live 95 years, you are but a blip on the timeline. Those who align that tiny little life with the flowing stream of God's goodness and His plan and His providence in the Great Commission to build the global church, those are the blessed ones. Those are the happy ones. May that be all of us here at Hope Church, those who will align their tiny lives with God's Great Commission, not our own empire building or our own consumeristic uh, consumption of goods, but building in the Great Commission. Those are they who will be blessed and given rewards by God in heaven. That's exactly the theme of today's passage. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and onwards, the theme is church leadership, and, and after the leadership, the people. Church leadership and the commitment, the fighting of the faith in the mission. Allow me to open up to our book this morning. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 6. The main theme, of the main idea, the main point of this book has been the church of God as the household of God on the mission of God. And so in today's passage really gets to the heart of, of leadership in the context of what Paul has been saying against the false teachers. He's saying that Christians and essentially, uh, uh, most importantly, pri- uh, primarily, the leaders have to, be, have to be in a fight. They have to see their life as in a fight. That they are inflamed with the Holy Spirit, filled with love, committed to God's commands for the eternal good of mankind and the eternal glory of God. So that we basically, to summarize the Great Commission, we preach the gospel, we baptize disciples, we plant churches, we keep on doing that until the nations are one, until Jesus comes back. You and I get to die, be forgotten, and then the mission keeps on going without us because Jesus is on the throne and he is glorifying his Father by building his church against which the gates of hell and pagan demons can not amount a defense. So there is necessity and there is eternal joy in serving Jesus in his mission for the church above all else. That's, that's the theme of today's passage. There is an urgency, a necessity, but there is also an eternal, deep, great, supreme joy in serving Jesus in his great commission above all other pursuits in life. Can you look with me to verse 11 of chapter 6 in the book of 1 Timothy? Paul says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. 
Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, amen? Amen. The King of kings and Lord of lords, amen? amen? Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one ever has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. And everyone said... May God bless his word in our midst to his glory this morning. Amen. Amen. Paul's theme this morning is church leadership. But as we've seen through the whole book, anything Timothy is commanded to do, he's then commanded to tell the rest of the church to do. The context for Ephesus, for Timothy, for this book and this letter has been that Timothy is left behind him and has been sent to Ephesus where Paul had originally planted a thriving mega church in a multicultural metropolis, one of the greatest cities of the Eastern Roman Empire, Ephesus. Yet in his absence, Paul has uh, 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 heard that there are false teachers rising up. The church is changing its mission. It is less missional. It is not seeing souls saved. Maybe they've gone years without seeing baptisms of new converts, without sending other church plants out. Three churches were planted that we see in the New Testament, at least in the time of, of, of Ephesus's early church life. That's Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Paul The the Ephesian church under Paul was a missionary church serving the Lord Jesus. It has been twisted and corrupted, and therefore Timothy is sent to set things in order, and he needs to apply the authority of God. It was a fearful task we've seen for such a young man who was naturally timid, not, not a natural public speaker. He needed to be reminded of the importance of his call and the urgency of the authority, the command, and the call that he was given. We've seen just the last uh, context from the verse above, verse 10, and really that's that passage about contentment, that the false teachers were deviating from truth. They were dividing the church into fractions. They were, uh, they were devouring in their consumerism and their, and, and their d- uh, uh, covetousness to have more money, using, using the ministry to make money. Paul says in that context, Timothy, you flee these things. But he doesn't call him Timothy, does he? He doesn't call him by name, he calls him by title. He doesn't call him what his mother and father told him. He calls him by what God identifies him as. He says, you man of God. Because man of God was an Old Testament uh, title or name that was spoken to the leaders of Israel, specifically those who led as spokespeople for God. So this is the prophets would be the man of God. Those who were given messages from God, from heaven, to declare to the people and by their declaration lead the people to godliness, they were the men of God. And Paul is calling Timothy a man of God. He is not, like the worldly false teachers, a man of the world. He's a man of God. He is not even a man of the people. He's not a people's pastor. He is not here in his role called by the eternal people. It is not the church. It is not the the, the flock that have commissioned him into his role. It is God through Paul. Timothy, we said this earlier in the book, before pastors work for the people of the church, they primarily serve Jesus. Men of God, preachers of God's message, will change, edit, twist, and dull, and blunt the, uh, the word of God, the message of God, if they see themselves primarily as working for the church. We don't work for the church. We serve the church by working for Jesus. Timothy is a man of God, not a man of Ephesus, not a man of the church, not even Timothy. He's not even a man of himself. He doesn't even belong to himself. He's been bought with a price and then commissioned on a mission. So he's a man of God. Paul is reminding him here that he is set and consecrated to a very particular task, and it is not to assimilate, it is not to amass a following, it is not to ask permission in the church. Timothy, even greater than 
pastors today, was sent with apostolic authority to, as if he was Paul himself, to start busting heads together, basically, firing elders, kicking out preachers, changing the doctrinal statements back to what Paul taught. He had a rough job. He's called a man of God, and he is told as a bold, courageous warrior, man of God, he is told to run away. Because that, doesn't that just instill courage? Run! Flee! Get out of here! That's Paul's first command to him here. Flee, man of God! Flee from these things. Well, what things is he meant to flee? He's meant to flee the sins that Paul has been talking about in the prior passages. Flee the sins of the false teachers. Flee the uh, assimilation to the world. Flee the simple uh, uh, go with the flow of the church. No, flee those things. Those things have led to this church's near ruin. Flee those. In every battle, there is strategic withdrawals. There is running away, not in cowardice, but in order to regroup. You run from that section. Maybe there's a pincer move going on. You need to withdraw, regroup, find your general, see the banners, go to your armor bearer, go there, regroup, then refight. Paul's saying pursue godliness. He'll tell us that soon, but flee these things. He says the exact same dynamic. This is a good dynamic for every Christian to keep in mind, not just those in formal pastoral ministry. Flee sin, chase righteousness. Flee evil, pursue good. It's not enough to just think flee sin, flee sin, flee sin, because you're going into a vacuum. What are you placing your feet upon? You are directionless, simply trying to escape. You can't escape sin. It's everywhere. Unless you have a conceptual mindset of what you are stepping to. We avoid sin and unrighteousness so that we might, having taken that off of the uh, uh, direction, compass, uh, 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 driver seat of our life, we might replace it with the good. It says, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. He says the same dynamic in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, apparently you have to hear it again, and Paul says it again. He says, flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is important for Timothy. Flee the evil. Don't get embroiled in every silly fight. Don't follow the example of those who are in the job for the money. Flee those things and pursue righteousness. By fleeing... He means to make up a strategic plan for avoiding sin. Some Christians will be willing. Maybe, they, maybe you just haven't thought through it enough yet. Maybe there's a general victim-minded laziness. Some Christians are really willing to agree to fight sin on the level of the heart and the mind in the life that I live. But I won't change my life. I will fight sin with the girlfriend that I live with. I will try really hard. Whoops, I slipped up again. I will try to flee sin really hard in the evil, godless, maybe even illegal career that I am currently pursuing. I'll try really hard to serve Jesus. Whoops, I keep slipping up. I will try really hard to serve Jesus as I put no other means or measures in my life to avoid sexual sin or online pornography. I will try really hard to flee sin as long as I don't have to change my actual lifestyle. And this is what Paul is commanding. Fleeing sin for the Christian and the pastor means not just live whatever life you're in, but on the inside, try and stay pure. He really means blast out some walls, put some TNT under the boulders, break open some of the mountains, course new roads. The Christian is called to repent and fight sin, not just on the inward level, but also on the lifestyle level. What relationship needs to end? What job maybe needs to change? Does your budget reflect a godly heart? Your time, your schedule, your routine, how you are actually living your life, spending your time, who you spend your time with, these are the degrees, this is the level upon which the Christian needs to flee from sin so that he might fight the good fight. <clears throat> Basically, Paul is telling him in reflection of last week, uh, last passage, if, you're, if you are in the job for the money, like the false teachers were, 
If you're preaching the gospel for money, you are not a man of God. You're one of the false teachers. I tell you, hope would not exist if our first pastor, Craig, had that mindset. For 15 plus months, he labored without pay from the church for the sake of the gospel. I ask how many businessmen, how many builders, how many apprentices or tradies would show up to even the second month of work if your boss kept on telling you it will be another 15 till you are paid. Liar. Repent. <laughs> Maybe he already does that. I don't know his boss. <laughs> Paul is saying, do not love money, serve God. You are a man of God before you belong to yourself, to the church, or to the world, or to the devil. Flee that and pursue from that, pursue, oh, flee from the evil to righteousness. Look at what he says here. Righteousness, that's a general lawfulness. Remember he said in chapter 1, the false teachers are abusing the law and using it as a whip upon the back of the people. But the law is good. Walk lawfully, which fulfills love. Godliness is the theme of the last paragraph. Uh, godliness, that is Christ-likeness following after God's likeness with contentment. That would be the comparison he's making. Godliness, not for gain, but for godliness' sake. Faith and love is a common couplet that Paul uses in his pastoral epistles. He does it again in 2 Timothy a lot. Uh, faith and love go together. Faith towards God, love towards mankind. Uh, probably the word here for faith is better translated faithfulness in this, in this theme, in this uh, passage. Faithfulness. That is a sturdiness, a loyalty, a fidelity to the calling that God has placed upon his life. Be faithful and love in comparison with the false teachers who are covetous and serve the people unsacrificially. They make them serve them so that they might be uh, uh, well-to-do, so that they might gain money. Paul commands, as his example was, as Jesus' example was, serve sacrificially. Serve out of love. Serve till you bleed. Lead till people hate you. And keep leading for the good of those people. Love them sacrificially. Do not fail to love when they fail to pay, unlike the false teachers. He says steadfastness and gentleness. Gentleness is important because with the urgency, with the intensity, with the importance, with the, uh, the, the, the heat and the zeal that this kind of ministry and mindset uh, uh, entails... Paul is telling Timothy, yet in all of your urgency and zeal and intensity, do not deal with Christ's bride harshly. Doesn't mean don't speak strong. I mean, you just read Paul's letter and you realize he doesn't have a problem with delivering straight up in front of the Christians, rebuke, exhort. He doesn't care how they feel, yet he is gentle with them, not overly harsh. Don't, don't become in, so important in your own calling and commission, Timothy, that you become impatient with those who are a little further back than you are. That you become impatient with those who are just like you a couple of months ago. Even Jesus was not so self-important that he dealt harshly with the disciples. Even Paul was not so inflamed with his important mission that he dealt harshly with Christians. Be gentle. Deal with them as those of dust, just as God does to you. Yet steadfastness is an all-important one here. Uh, endurance, maybe your version says, perseverance, because no other virtue, hear me say this, no virtue in your Christian life matters if you don't have steadfastness. No discipline that you have in your whole Christian life matters at all if you don't have steadfastness. Steadfastness is the quality that makes all of those virtues lifelong and long-lived, so that it's not just reading my Bible every day for the last quarter of a fortnight. I'm not just staying pure sexually for the entirety of the last 24 hours, and I'm trying. It's not just that I'm serving church and getting to church. I've gotten to church every single Sunday the last week, and I might do it next year too. You know, Christmas is coming. Maybe I'll make a, a two-week commitment then. No, steadfastness takes virtues and makes them sink deep enough into the soil that they are there long enough to bear fruit. Steadfastness takes disciplines and turns a simple hammer strike with a chisel, turns that into the building of a grand cathedral and palace. That's what steadfastness does. Continual perseverance. Your, your whole Christian life is made up of nothing. This is going to sound dumb. It's so simple, but it is true. It's so true. I've got music from heaven to back it up. Uh, 
your entire Christian life is simply built upon what you do each day. So if you live a mediocre, mostly ungodly, uncommitted, unzealous Christian day, that is what your 20-year cycle will be. Under par, sliding through, floating along, not offering up my life as weapons to God for righteousness. Paul calls on these things, steadfastness with all of these other virtues, especially to Timothy, that his behavior in an unhealthy church setting will be to see himself as a man of God, not to follow their example, but rather pursue God's high command with endurance. That's his behavior in this setting. That's what Paul's calling for. And the church that needs strong leadership, that should be his behavior. But there is also a beckoning. That is a sense of calling and commission that Paul once again reminds Timothy of. Look at verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the conf good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul sees, we've said this before, we'll say it again, I'll say it till I die. Paul sees the Christian ministry and in fact the whole Christian life and everything the church does, in fact Jesus' entire reign and rule, he sees all of that within the grand concept and idea and imagery of God at war against the darkness. The church is a war machine. The pastor is a warfare strategizer and leader. Christians are soldiers in the fight. He says it everywhere. He says it in chapter 1, wage the good warfare. He'll say it in 2 Timothy, even saying of himself, uh, Paul, at the end of his life, he goes, here's what's on my gravestone. Though he didn't get a gravestone. So here's what, what's on my gravestone. I ran the race, I fought the good fight, now my head's going to be lopped off and my blood poured out like a drink offering upon the altar of Jesus Christ. Amen, hallelujah. I fought, I raced, I won. Fighting the good fight under the Lord Jesus Christ means that there is no spiritual pacifism. I don't really in this moment care about your political uh, 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 tendencies, but in the spiritual mindset, there is no pacifism. Oh, we just love Jesus and let the world go its way and, and we don't really bother about others and you believe what you believe and, and maybe other Christians, you believe what you believe. You know, we all just love each other. We hold hands, we sing Kumbaya, we'll see each other at the end of the race. There is no spiritual pacifism. Those are called cowards and Paul, Paul condemns them. Rather, every Christian is called into warfare to battle against the devil, unbelief, their own flesh, the world system, sin, Competing worldviews and religions and philosophies, we fight those. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 that we wage warfare with great grappling hooks of arguments from God's word so that we might destroy and pull down opposing worldviews and philosophies and religions. That's the Christian warfare. And we do battle against false teachers like Timothy is told to do in this letter. We are to wage the good warfare of the faith. Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. The language faith in the New Testament, that Greek word, sometimes it means your personal apprehension or your personal trust in Jesus Christ, which alone receives all of the benefits Jesus earned on the cross for you. Faith, that is the one instrument of justification. The, the one way that you are saved is by trusting by faith in Jesus Christ. That, that's faith. Other times, faith can mean, as we saw earlier, faithfulness. Your loyalty and commitment to a certain mindset and to God. Other times, the faith, with the definite article there, the faith is meaning the Christian faith. And it really means the, the whole body of doctrine, the whole, the whole system of teaching that God has revealed to mankind. The faith is really just to say uh, the entire system of beliefs that God has given to mankind through his prophets and apostles, the faith. Jude talks about it saying, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That is, you can imagine a, a deposit from heaven coming down on golden uh, uh, sheets being delivered to humanity. And, and this is the faith. It, it didn't happen like that. It happened through human authors. But that's the mindset that the Christian should have of the word of God and the system we call the Christian faith. So what is Paul saying when he says, fight the good fight, of the faith. He is meaning that every Christian should see themselves 
as an inheritor of the grandest deposit ever known by mankind. Every Christian should see themselves as called to defend and enjoy, but defend the grandest and the most glorious gift that God has given to mankind. That is the gospel, the faith, the system of Christian truth. Now here's the, here's the contrast. We don't defend it by keeping it to ourselves like monarchs and emperors might do with a great piece of gold, with a great treasury. We don't defend the faith. We don't fight for the faith by keeping others away from it. We actually defend the faith by propagating it, by sharing it, by preaching it. That's the point of 1 Timothy. This church is unhealthy because they're burying their treasure, not sharing it with the world. But in the sharing it, in the contextualization, in the giving it out, in the speaking to other worldviews and mindsets, you must not let it be perverted. In that sense, we preserve it. We keep it pure. We don't tolerate mixture or twisting of this message. We fight the good fight of the faith in large part by propagating it, in large part by defending it as well. So Paul wants the Christians to see themselves as called to, starting with Timothy and every other Christian, you are called to the greatest honor that God could give to any man, to any woman, to any child, which is guard the deposit that God himself has breathed into this word. Pursue the defense of the gift, the faith that has been granted from heaven into this world, into your heart, into your hands. There was a mindset that would have been familiar to Paul's audience, Paul's day and age, to Paul himself. The the mindset was one of the inheritance that was yours to live in the glorious, wonderful Roman Empire. That is that they believed themselves to be this, this unseen, unprecedented thing that had never graced the realm of mankind and this thing we call earth. That never before had they seen such a peaceful, such a glorious, such a rich and flourishing, such a prosperous, such a bringing together of all kinds of people that they had seen in this thing called the Roman Empire. Uh, Roma Eterna, they used to say, the eternal Rome. They believed that it would be an eternal city that would live forever. Look at what the gods have done in establishing this. So you, if you're in the army of Rome, if you are defending Rome against barbarians on her borders, or if you're in the guard closer to the city, or if you're in a dispatched legion, or if you're just even simply a citizen or a member that lives within this grand and glorious Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, this wonderful empire, you ought to see yourself as an inheritor as a gift from the gods to this world. You you stand in a long line of men and women that have bled and died for the glory of this city and empire. That was their mindset. Their their origin myths of Rome, I wonder if you're familiar with it, with Romulus and Remus that they claimed were uh, uh, brothers born of a human mother and uh, the god Mars who had slept with her. And Romulus and Remus were twins born and they were thrown out by superstition by the city in which they lived and and they were washed away by a river and washed up on a bank where a wolf mother found them, nursed them into boyhood where they were found later, raised into warriors and they established the city of Rome. These, These divine beings, humans established Rome. And so they would go on to believe as as the the cult of the empire kind of would grow in many centuries to come, uh, the divine status of their leader. The Caesar was a son of the gods. He he held divine status, and in many places, especially like Ephesus in Asia Minor, the the emperor was worshipped with with an incense offering. Kaiser, kurios, they would say, Caesar is Lord and Lord of Lords. They'll place their offering upon the altar. And they would worship him. There was a story many centuries earlier that kind of embodied the kind of pride you would have in being one who fought for Rome. There was a man uh, by the name of Horatius. And as the, let me get the the people right. As the uh, uh, Etruscans were uh, invading and fighting against Rome, a a, a smaller city-state than it would become, uh, this is in the 6th century B.C., 
as the Etruscans were coming through, they had uh, pushed through the outer limits and they had come to the Tiber River. Sort of that last uh, crossing point before you get to Rome proper, the city itself. And upon that river stood a, a small and solitary bridge which really only stood about two horse breadths wide, meaning three men could defend it against an oncoming army and just that is what happened. Horatius grabbed two of his men as they were fleeing the Etruscans who were making such a, a mighty pursuit of the Roman Empire and thwarting them and killing them. As the Roman army was fleeing into the city to get behind the walls, Horatius halted two of his best men turned to face the Etruscans and said, the three of us can defend this bridge and we shall to our death. They moved forward. They started to fight the Etruscan army and were slaying them because you would only take on one to a man. The ratio would remain quite well because of the bottleneck of the bridge. And as, it, as they began to tire, Horatius, knowing himself mortal, called to the Roman soldiers on the distant bank and said, begin to destroy the bridge. He began, he continued to fight the Etruscans in front of him as Romans behind him began to chop at the, at the base and at the connecting uh, parts of the bridge to the land so that, so that in time it began, to, it began to sway, it began to crack and it was soon to fall into the river. And Horatius saw himself as not, not one who had the right to claim for himself Life and, more, and, 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 and long life in the mountainside if it would come at the cost of his fellow Romans and the eternal city for which he stood. He saw himself as an inheritor of that and so gave his life in the protection and the defense of Rome. He stood there and uh, before long it looked as if the Etruscans would, would breach them and the bridge was not yet broken. He, he took his two men and he hurled them backwards and said, keep the, 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 the destruction, you keep breaking the bridge. And he stood there, a, a, so, a, a sole lone soldier, fighting the Etruscans and holding them back until the river fell and he plunged to his death with mortal wounds and heavy armor dragging him to the bottom of the Tiber. This is the kind of, this is the kind of boldness and courage that a legacy mindset, that a pride in one's belonging has upon a man. And this is the kind of thing Paul wants to see embodied in the Christian individual. That in each local church, you would recognize that in the word of God, and in the preaching of the gospel, and in the assembly of immortal, eternal saints, as we worship King Jesus, you would see yourself as an inheritor of such an amazing legacy that you would fight and give yourself your whole life through with endurance and perseverance for the sake of the defense and the propagation of the faith. And doesn't, doesn't the true story of Christianity just put to shame all of those silly pagan origin myths? First of all, because it's true. <laughs> it actually happened. There wasn't some wolf mother with half God's sons suckling in the bush. Right? It's true. The one true God actually became man, not half man, true man, full man, not half God, not one of the many gods in the pantheon. No, the one true God, Yahweh, took on real human flesh and didn't just set an amazing example for us, which he did, but perfectly fulfilled all the laws that he had spoken in long ages past and then went to the cross of crucifixion to pay and die for all those who would ever be members of his eternal city and established in his blood and in his resurrection the foundation of a city which cannot die, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, whose builder and designer is God. The true story of Christianity ought to inspire in us more faithfulness than the pagan myth demon origins of failing Rome, which is now in ruins. You can go and see it. Uh, it it's now uh, dust and broken bricks. Jesus' kingdom is still growing, still omnipotent, still unstoppable. That kind of legacy mindset that you belong to a long line of Christian soldiers, builders, defenders, watchmen, that's what we stand in. And that should call us to a sense of defense, propagation, and a pride, a, a pride to live and die for this cause. He says, fight the good fight. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, 1800s Baptist preacher. He was, uh, his, his final public address before he died. 
his final public address before he died after his thousands of sermons preached, hundreds of prayer meetings addressed, his final public address before he died in 1892 was in 1891 where he addressed in the midst of the Baptist Union and sort of the evangelical church uh, uh, landscape in general in England a great downgrade. Uh, the, the churches had begun to, to um, tolerate Darwinism. Maybe humanity doesn't bear God's image. We're just the most evolved. Uh, does God really exist? They would ask. Well, that's not really important. It matters how you live, was the idea of enlightened modernism. Is the Bible really written by God? Well, no. It was written by men who had great experiences with God, whether or not he exists. So it's a good historical document to consider. Does the cross of Jesus really save from sin? Well, that's a silly, obscure, little pathetic idea, isn't it? Blood let out by one man who was born of a virgin. We know that doesn't happen. We're scientists now. Uh, uh, blood let out on a, on a Roman cross. No, this is a tremendous story. And, and like Romulus and Remus, it really does settle some courage in people's hearts. But is it true? No, it's, it's beautiful myth. Does only Jesus and faith in Jesus called Christianity... Does only faith in Jesus save us from wrath and hell to come and give us eternal life? Oh, no, they would say. Well, maybe, but, but not necessarily, and probably not, they would often say. You know, there's many paths that all lead to Rome, they used to say in the empire. All roads lead to Rome. All religions lead to some experience of God. Now, I'm, I'm naming something that I wish died at least with or shortly after Spurgeon back in the 1800s, but I'm describing maybe a good majority of so-called churches today in our landscape. Like, that's, that's the statement of faith. They're, they're amening. Every heresy I was just daring to spew out in your fine presence. It didn't die then, but it was worth the fight. Uh, many many, many uh, historians or biographers believe that this downgrade controversy was called as the Baptist Union and many evangelicals were swinging to tolerate this nonsense and Spurgeon, the, the most famous Baptist in the country and really in the world, was standing firm for the faith and he was called a fundamentalist, a, a, a Neanderthal, this low-browed, silly ape man who believes in the literal interpretation of Scripture as God breathed. The actuality and factuality of Jesus' death on the cross in place of sinners. The reality of one God who made the whole world. Oh, come on. This man, he, he stood in defense of that faith as he received uh, not just controversy, but conflict, attack, and no doubt spiritual attack. Many believe that that is what worsened his gout and his nervous system breakdown to such a degree that he would die the following year. And in his final public address, he commended and commanded his church and the pastors he was training and the broader evangelical uh, landscape to stand firm in the faith on precisely these doctrinal issues. Do you remember the names of those who were attacking him for doing so? Do you remember? Do you remember the names of the hundreds and thousands who said that this old ancient religion is going to pass away so that the new liberal postmodern religion might... Do you remember the names of those people? No one does. They have forgotten because their lives were committed to an irrelevant nonsense which passed away with them. The lies continue because Satan's still here. Their names are forgotten. They signed their life away into uselessness. We are glad to spit upon their graves. Glory to God for soldiers like Timothy, for defenders like Spurgeon, for people like Lady Jane Grey. Before we get... <clears throat> Lady Jane Grey died by the sword under Queen Mary in England, 1554, because she would not give up her belief in justification by faith alone and that Jesus alone was the head of the church. The Catholic Church wanted her to acknowledge the Pope, the monarch, is the head of the church and justification is not by faith alone. Oh, we have to do some good works according to the church also. She would not say it and that 16-year-old gave her life away, rotting in jail and eventually bled upon the beheading block for Jesus. Martin Luther lived his life under similar and worse controversy than Spurgeon. Where are you and I? Do you see yourself as in that legacy? As an inheritor of and a right defender of the greatest deposit ever given by God to humanity, the faith. That is what Paul is commanding Timothy to embody. 
Timothy to actualize in his life. Look at what he says in verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He's reminding him of his ordination service. Remember, Timothy, we prayed over you. You gave your testimony. We prayed. We laid hands. A prophetic word was given that you would be a mighty preacher. You were given the gift of teaching. He says that in 2 Timothy. And then you were sent. You went with me. I sent you back. Don't forget that calling. You yourself sealed your life and soul into this calling by your confession in many witnesses' presence, Timothy. He says, take hold of eternal life. We might think it a bit strange for Paul to tell a Christian, take hold of eternal life. We assume Timothy's saved, right? Let's just begin with that premise. So how then can Timothy grasp or take hold of what he already has? But it's very simple. We should not overthink it. We should not think that Paul is telling Timothy to work for salvation. There's plenty of things that you have of great worth that are not necessarily utilized. You might possess them, but using them to their full potential is not the same. You might have a, have a wife at home that, that, that you should sow into more and, 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 and uh, invest in more, and, and, and you're not. Well, do that. Oh, you might, have a, a, you might have a 67 Mustang sitting in the garage at home collecting dust, and shame on you. I will not be annoyed if that wakes me up in the middle of the night. Get it out and let it open her up on the roads. A soldier might have a sword that is sitting nicely on the display cabinet while the barbarians are coming into the empire and they're being told, use that which you have. Take hold of the eternal life which you have been given so that you might wage the warfare, defend the faith, and live a life worth living. Timothy, take grasp of that. It reminds me of this story uh, years ago. I heard uh, this passage preached by a pastor and he used this story. Uh, there was a, a in Ireland's past, l- long ago, the, the, uh, the monarch, whoever it was, the, the lord maybe, was, was allocating royal lands to the commoners. And if you could get to the land and name the allotment as yours, and the first piece of flesh that would place their hand upon the, the, the land, uh, along that allotment, they would be the lord of that acreage, of that allotment, and your children would be set. You are now a lord, uh, an owner of land and many subjects. What a... What a glorious gift. And so out the, the ambitious uh, uh, prospectors went. They, they got into their uh, uh, boats. They were rowing up the river and looking for lands and landmarkers which to grab. And there was one story of a man who is the ancestor of some of the princes of Ulster. So, so this is good news. How did he win? How did he get there? He was racing alone in his boat to get to the land allotment visible over uh, up near the horizon. And as he was racing, another boat full of men with many oars, began to overtake them. Began to overtake him, and though they raced and though courage stirred him on, he began to fail. And they were getting quite close towards the, towards the shore, and, and the, the other boat began to pull out in front of him. Still, you know, a stone's throw away, but they were going to get there first. So all it took was a hand upon the shore, and it's yours. And, and so he stops rowing. Well, they've got him now, they thought. And out of what would have looked like self-punishment he draws his axe lays his hand upon the bulwark of the ship and slices off his own hand strange move of depression i suppose the other ship pulls up onto shore bow the boat breaching the sand they jump off and what is there waiting for them on the shore but a severed hand of the man behind them He had won. His hand upon the shore was worthwhile for all that those would come and inherit after him. It's it's that kind of bulldoggedness that Paul is calling Timothy to. Take hold of it no matter the cost, Timothy. Throw away what you need to. Leave behind what you must. Pursue and take hold of what is rightly yours, eternal life. He then speaks of the blessed hope. We've seen his behavior his beckoning, now his blessed hope. And this needs really just reading more than explanation. There's not a lot to explain here. It's a little bit, but mostly it's meant to move us to worship and loyalty. Look at verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. I charge you in his presence. God not only, not only gives life, but is in the presence of all. Is that he? He's saying, the Christian is living. Timothy, you are ministering. The church is conducting herself right under God's eyes. He's not far distant like Zeus. 
He's here. He is giving life to all things. He's right here. Live your life, coram Deo, the Latin used to be, before the face of God. I charge you in his presence. And of Christ Jesus. That is, and in the presence of Jesus. It's as if Paul is saying as an, as an apostle, I'm placing the blade upon your shoulder here, Timothy, but God is here. His son Jesus is behind me. We speak with unified voice by the Holy Spirit. I charge you, the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Then he points to Jesus' example. Who made the good confession in the, in, in the presence of Pontius Pilate? Remember John 18, at least as one example? Jesus thrown before Pilate to give an account and, and Pontius is, is mocking him and, and questioning him and asking him, are you a king? And Jesus' word is, well, that's what they say. That's what you say. He goes on to say, the lines repeated are, my kingdom, so yes, he's a king, is not of this world. And maybe on first account that sounds, oh, that's not threatening to Pontius because his kingdom isn't of this world. No. no. He's saying my kingdom does not come from this world, but you better believe it does come to this world. It's from God. I've got an origin and a source and an authority pilot that is far and higher above you. Be threatened. He declared himself king. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, you're not the only one who might die for the confession Christ is Lord. As far as Pontius was concerned, Jesus himself was persecuted and was dying for his confession that Christ is Lord. Jesus is king. He did not waver. He did not deny. He did not turn his mouth away to falsehood when asked of the truth. He kept his testimony pure. He made the good confession. Look at verse 14. This is his charge. In the presence of Jesus, in the presence of God, Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, what's the commandment? That's the whole Christian call, this whole letter, Timothy, the whole commission you receive to go and preach. That whole commandment needs to be unstained from error and heresy. And uh, what's the other word? Unstained and free from reproach. That's his behavior. Don't, don't fall into evil and then bring reproach upon yourself, your testimony, the message you preach, and the entire church. That's what the false teachers have done. Keep it from error. Keep it from sin. Until when? What's the timeline of Christian ministry? How long do we fight for? Missionaries have to tell themselves, we've been told maybe a two and a half day hike up this near vertical island uh, mountain against the rivers. But, but here's a timeline. It's a depressing thing usually when you're told, until you're dead, until the end. When's the end? You don't know. Well, no one knows. Keep going. Psychological uh, studies show that if you know the time frame of your endurance, uh, the endurance um, uh, uh, capacity multiplies by a factor of about 100. That is, I can apply 100-fold the pain to you for a minute long if you know it's only a minute. If it's un unknown time, you will give up after a few seconds. Knowing the time frame means everything, and Jesus does and doesn't give us a time frame here through Paul, doesn't he? Until I come back. All right, so we know. How many days is that? How many blood moons away? How many wars is that? How many months until that happens? Oh, you don't know. <laughs> That's not for you to know. You battle, you battle, you battle, you defend, you fight, you wage, you live, you pursue righteousness till Jesus takes you out of this world in death or until he returns in glory. And that is the Christian blessed hope. Look at what he says. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at our time, at our appointed time, at our desired time, at the proper time. Whenever it is, it is the perfect time in God's will and his plan. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Take that, Caesar. You're not even a sovereign. You're a servant. You're not even impressive. You're a slave of the real king the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the kurios of all kurioses, who alone has immortality. The first emperor, Julius Caesar, would be killed, stabbed in the back. He can die. Presidents are assassinated, sometimes by their own people. Emperors were killed often by the Praetorian Guard, their own secret service, basically, in the Roman Empire. God has immortality. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, has immortality. He is unchanged, by 
human affairs, by political changes, by warfare, by other philosophies, ideals, ideas, religions, and demons, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one ever has seen or can see. This is high Christology, isn't it? Paul is talking about the Jesus who returns. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only sovereign. He is God who is immortal. He is God who dwells in unapproachable light. The only way he can be beheld, the only way he can be known is through the revelation of the word and the condescension of his incarnation before us. But no one can walk up to him and topple him, kill him, slay him, change him, defer him. Immortality dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. No one has beheld with their human eyes the pure divine presence to him, this Jesus, to him, our Savior, to him, the King, the Lord, be honor and eternal dominion. And everybody said, Amen. that's what the Christian's called to. That's what this church is called to until Jesus comes back. Serve Jesus Christ by keeping the deposit of the faith unstained, defended, upheld, propagated to the planting of many churches, to the salvation and winning of many souls, to the eternal kingdom and eternal city of heaven in Christ's blood, and to the eternal glory of Jesus Christ alone. Everything, Van Til used to say, Dutch theologian, everything he used to say in the Christian's life is done for the king. Pro rege should be imprinted on our eyeballs, our hearts and our souls. For the king. King, eternal, in dominion and glory and honor, Jesus Christ alone. And everybody said, my question is this. When Jesus Christ comes back and you see him in all of that glory with uncountable angels, a sword in his hand, an enormous white horse underneath him, kingdom come, consummated, time ended, no more time. No time to fix anything up. Repentance has gone now. We are sealed in whatever we have done and lived, will you be found, as a Christian, I'm talking to the saved now, will you be found joyful in that moment? Or will you be found s frustrated? I, next year was going to be my fruitful year. I was going to serve him after my degree finished. I was really going to commit to church once I got financially stable. I, I was going to serve him oh, the, when the world political sort of uh, uh, heat died down a bit and it wasn't so drastic to be a Christian. I meant, well, intentions mean nothing. Christ wants faithfulness. He wants service. When he comes, will that be a day of joy for you? I, I know it will. Even for the regretted, frustrated Christian with very little rewards in the next life, it will still be joy because it's the end of sin, it's the end of history, and it's entrance into glory. We're saved by grace alone. But bank for that day. Wage war for that day. Live until that day to give all glory and honor to Jesus with your life in and through the mission of the church. This is a universal statement. I say it to myself every day. Do more for the kingdom of God. That's, that shouldn't be insulting. Do more for your local church. No matter how much you give or how withdrawn you are, how little you give or do or serve, do more. There's nothing more glorious. There's no eternal city or kingdom or empire more worthy of your service than Jesus Christ. Do more. But, but for those who are in this moment not trusting alone for your salvation in the cross of Jesus, in the perfect life of Jesus, in the resurrection of Jesus, and in his merit before God for you, if you're not trusting in that, Trust in that today. Jesus has loved you. And unlike the Roman gods and emperors, he did not give a perfect command that you must fulfill, then you can inherit. He did not say there's eternal life on offer if you strain your life enough and sacrifice enough to get there. He said, I have purchased everything for you and give you a free gift out of love and grace. I mean, even if Jesus told you a few things to do, you couldn't do it anyway. That's not how we get to heaven but by simply trusting and resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ for you. Believe today and be saved. Christians, labor for this king. Let's pray. Father God, the global church, the historical church, and every individual local church has no power, no existence, no life, no hope of continuing on except by your glorious sovereign lordship power given to us by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the word that he wrote so that we can understand with his help. 
We thank you for the gifts that he gives so that people can serve the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the assurance that he gives to our hearts so that we can strain forwards and wage the good warfare knowing that our inheritance in heaven has nothing to do with our labors. Please give him to us now to renew our mind, clarify our mind, search our hearts, know us and bring forth any way that we need to repent so that we can serve Jesus more, so that the day of his return is a blessed hope waited for, not something we are praying is put off. Father God, would you use this church not only to survive? We don't want that, Lord. We don't want to float on. We want to defend the faith. We want to see many saved. We want to see Jesus glorified and churches planted for the sake of the legacy of the eternal kingdom to which we belong. We pray all of these things for the wonderful, glorious name of Jesus Christ, the one true Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.